All right. I used to be a Microsoft guy. And then I was declared clinically dead. And then, <laughs> and then after a, uh, a uh, miraculous revival and a unexpected recovery, I had a clean slate. I had a, had a second chance of life. And now I'm a Linux and Drupal guy. Any, any questions? <laughs> no, no. I, so I have some questions. I have some questions. Um, why, you know, like how, how did I end up on my deathbed in Thailand? And was it my fault or was it out of my control? Um, and why was I only able to, to communicate by wiggling my toes? And what was I communicating? And are there any, any habits or actions or mindsets that we can take uh, to, to better ourselves in the face of adversity? And, uh, you know, if I could be anything, what would I be and why? And why, why do my Bluetooth headphones never connect when I need them to? <laughs> so, I am Dallas Ramsden, and I'm grateful to be with you today. Uh, this is a story about my uh, recovery, uh, rebuilding my life after a, an accident on a train in Thailand shattered my skull to pieces. And um, I, had to, I had to adapt to fundamental changes in my life. I had to relearn how to walk. I had to relearn how to talk. And this is a, this is a story about, uh, about resilience and about uh, perseverance. And it's a story about letting go. And it's a story about smiling again. And it's actually a story that starts here in Sydney 20 years ago. Um, and it's... It, a decision to travel to Thailand was made at the, at the Trails Cafe um, at the YHA Youth Hostel um, up by the Harbor Bridge uh, in, in, at the Rocks. So 20 years ago. Um, so just a word of caution, this is a, uh, this is a, a deeply personal journey and it's uh, some heavy topics will be talked about and, and some medical situations will be involved. And so if, if you feel uneasy at any point, feel, fr feel free to leave. Um, if, you, if you need to. All right, so 2004, I was a university exchange student at uh, Newcastle University, north of here, and I f immediately fell in love with Australia. I, f I, f I, loved, I loved the culture, I loved the people, I loved the food, and um, I scheduled, strategically scheduled my classes so I could have light classes on Monday and Friday so that I could travel as much as I could responsibly, um, not missing too much school. Guy that I traveled with was also an international student, um, Andy Bale. He and I traveled a lot in Australia, and we decided to travel to, to Thailand together. Uh, fellow fellow Yankee from uh, from US as well. This is uh, the day before we flew in. We flew into Thailand and uh, rode the tuk tuk around, and then um, the next day we were catching our 13-hour train ride from Bangkok to Chiang Mai. Uh, the, the the very next day. And um, it was a nice trip. It was, I, I packed my, my, my luggage, I packed my guitar, and I was reading a book and uh, you know, conversing with strangers, and that's all I remember. That's all I remember of the, of, of the trip. Uh, about halfway through the journey, um, I, was found, uh, I was found unconscious. Hang it, like half my, uh, the upper half of my body was, was hanging out the train window, and my skull was, was shattered to the point where the bones um, stuck up like, like, like a stegosaurus through, through my scalp, and, and, and I was bleeding profusely. And the, um, to this day, we don't know what exactly happened. There's, there's conflicting stories. Um, the newspaper says that, that there was a few of us taking sights, uh, taking photographs out the window, but if that's the case, then why wasn't anyone else hit? Um, my mom says she was told that... Um, that a, a woman standing next to me felt my arm go limp and looked down, saw that I was bleeding, and went to get her boyfriend. Uh, and it could have been just me. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. And it's something I've had to come to deal with and, and accept that I may never know. Um, and anyway, so two, so I'm bleeding badly. Two university students, two medical students uh, were found, and they came in. They did first aid on me. Um, T-shirts and towels were found, and... Um, to, to soak up the blood because there's your your scalp can't actually um, it, it doesn't actually congeal it, it just it just pours out and so they they, they were mopping up with the blood with um, 
with shirts and towels and, and, and wrapped around my head to, to slow the bleeding and um, to, to keep my head intact. And the reality was this happened in the middle of nowhere Thailand and the train just can't stop, um, just can't stop. And so for 45 minutes this continued until the train could, you know, there was a spot to unload and it was a, uh, it was a, remote, a remote village. And um, so at this, at this remote village, the, there was a first aid station. So what they did is I put some Vaseline on my head and they wrapped my head in gauze. Cause, and that's, that's all they had available at this, at this remote uh, town, the village. And um, it's our tour guide, Joe is his name, a native, native Thai uh, person. And um, so he was speaking the language and he was trying to get a helicopter, a medical helicopter to fly in. He was contacting um, commercial helicopters, and he was, he was talk, uh, talking to the Thailand military to get a helicopter flown in. And uh, they kept refusing, because what, what happens is with an open head wound, the, the changes in the air pressure, changes in the air pressure uh, are known to cause fatal seizures. And so that they didn't want the risk of an international tourist dying on their, international, you know, on their flight and causing an international outcry. So, they, so no medical helicopters were available. So what was found was a, a rural, uh, just a basic care hospital, um, about a 45 minute drive to a different village. And so that's how I went there uh, via passenger van, by, by just a van. Uh, so it was, it was my unconscious self, uh, it was Andy um, and, the, um, and the two university students, the medical students and myself. Um, See what another notes here. Sorry, this is, a, this is a lot of details. So the um, yeah, okay. So at this rural hospital, at this rural hospital, uh, again, not they didn't have sufficient medical equipment to tend to my to, to tend to my open wound, and but I had lost I had lost so much blood at this point that I did get a blood transfusion at this remote remote hospital, and um, it, it was becoming more and more apparent to you know people in charge taking care of me that I just was not going to make it at this hospital. And again, requests for helicopters were denied. And so there was only one viable option. And that was to take me via the same passenger van, the van, un, you know, unmedically equipped, um, back a six hour drive to, to Bangkok. And um, so, to, so here we go. So now we are, oops, I guess I was supposed to be going home. Um, oops. Oh, sorry, I missed, I did the Google Meet. Anyway, here we go. Hello? There we go. So, the arrival. I did, uh, when, when, when the van um, arrived to Bangkok, the hospital that I was supposed to go to couldn't be found. Uh, just because it's, it's, I mean, I can understand why it couldn't be found. It's, it's a very big city. It's a very undocumented city. And... They dropped me off at, at Boomerangrad, and that, so from the, from the moment of impact, from the moment of impact to arrival of Boomerangrad Hospital, it was 32 hours um, without any major medical um, fixes to, to, to my skull. And just for context, 32 hours is, if we think about when this conference started at 9 p, uh, a.m. yesterday, from 9 a.m. till now is about 28 hours. So for 32 hours, I was, I was pretty much bleeding uncontrollably, um, and upon arrival, I was declared dead. And, um, and I was in a not in a good state. And, um, and the doctors didn't want to work on me um, because I was in such a, I was in a horrific, horrific state. Um, and it, it, there was one doctor that wanted to work, that um, was compelled to try, and that's because he had studied local Thai doctor, he, he had studied at the University of Wisconsin, which is where I was a student, and he felt compelled to, to try to help me. And um, so he told my dad later that, uh, you know, he, he gave me some of the most powerful drugs available, um, and he worked on me for two hours, but he was, he was going to, you know, just give up and go to his other responsibilities. And then all of a sudden it came back to life. And uh, that's what he told my dad. So at this point, I'm no, I'm no longer clinically dead. I'm in a coma. I'm in a coma. And um, um, I'm bad, but I'm also battling some serious, serious medical conditions. One is 
I, I had contracted um, that whatever it's called, the Pseudomonas aeruginosa meningitis, which is extremely, extremely rare bacteria that comes from invasive surgeries such as blood transfusions. And um, it's, so, it's so fatal, it has what's called a uh, guarded prognosis. And um, it's a medical term. But the, uh, so anyway, so I was, I was, fighting, I was fighting that. It, it's it's, it's uh, antibacterial, or sorry, antibiotic resistant. Um, it's really hard to fight. I was also leaking, continuously leaking uh, uh, spinal fluid or, or brain fluid out my ears and nose. It's common in, in head trauma. And uh, brain swelling, I was also one of the bigger battles I was going through. Um, if you sprained your wrist or your, or your foot, you know, like you know that it swells, you put ice and it reduces the swelling. Uh, the brain, because of the skull, it doesn't, have the, it doesn't have the luxury to expand. And so what happens is that pressure builds up and it, it, it keeps re-injuring the brain. And it's kind of a recursion of death. And it's, it's, it's very, it's very, very, very um, critical, very critical. Um, I also had pneumonia in my right lung. I was um, having trouble breathing, so they had to put some, some tubes down my throat to, um, to clear the airway. A few days later, I woke up from my coma. And um, by this point, my, my uh, family had made it over to Bangkok. Um, they had to get emergency passports. Um, and um, it was not, not easy for my family. But when I woke up from my coma, the very first fuzzy memory I have is looking to my left, having no idea what, I just had no idea what was happening. And I look to my left and I see them, my, my family crying and, 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 and um, jumping and being happy. And it's like, I just, as I, I, you know, I thought I was, I thought they were, I didn't know what was going on, but I waved to them. And, um, but my very first clear memory was that I really, really, really had to pee. And the... Again, so I looked down, you know, I was totally not aware of what, what was happening, but I see these hoses, you know, these, these tubes in my arm, wires on my fingers, and I have to go to the bathroom, right? Like, I'm, I'm not going to pee in a stranger's bed, so I just take, start taking them out. And, um, and then uh, I, I go to stand. I try to stand, and just in an indescribable dizziness, like just, just, a, um, just like, a, like, a, like imagine like a... a, a going on a, 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 you know, a merry-go-round, right, and just being thrown off that merry-go-round. And, you know, my, my legs were weak, and I slammed into the ground. And, um, but I had to go to the bathroom. And so I started crawling and, 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 and um, uh, taking the IVs with me. When I, was in the, when I was finished with the bathroom, my dad had come in and helped me the rest of the way. He, uh, but um, when I was finished, I went to wash my hands, and I saw myself, I saw myself in the mirror for the first time. And two realizations, two realizations. One is I saw myself in a hospital robe, and I knew that I, I was the one in the hospital. I knew that this, I, I, it became clear to me that this situation was I was in the hospital. And the second realization was I saw this, this, bearded, this, this bearded stranger with, with deep, dark, sunk, purple, bruised eyes, and I had a shocking scar that ran the entire length of my, my, my head down my face. I had crusty lips and, and, and uh, you know, shaved head. And uh, I realized that that was me. And I hated it. I hated myself. I hated myself. And that's my first memory. All right, a few days, well, a few days later, like, um, like I said, my family was here. And um, I had intended to read this whole letter, but the um, sake of time, I can't. But I wanted to, to demonstrate the fear and the uncertainty and the hope and the, just the encouragement that was going on. Um, but so in this letter, you know, my, my sister, she's telling the world um, about um, how I had opened my eyes for the first time and I could follow voices. I couldn't see anything, but I could follow their voices. And um, this, she talks about how, uh, you know, I could respond to holding, people holding my hand and, and, and holding their hand tightly if I thought they were going to be, you know, leaving. And um, that she talks about how the doctor was telling us that it's going to be 18 months before they can even determine what, what the cause is, what's, what's the impact of my life. It's going to be 18 months. Um, so this, that's what that um, letter was supposed to be. Now, I didn't do, I didn't recover in, by myself. I, th my, my story went viral at the time. Um, chain emails were a thing, right? Remember you copied everyone in your address book and you sent that out and they did the same thing, everyone to their address book. And, and also at the same, this is the year that Facebook was launched. 
And so this story spread across Facebook like crazy, and, and uh, friends' blogging sites were, were put up, and people were blogging and messaging, and uh, hundreds and hundreds of cars and strangers and friends and flowers and messages all came from, from across the planet, people I just didn't even know. And I didn't even know this for 20 years until I told my mom that I was giving this talk, and she was like, oh, I have all these cards. So, so for the first time, like... For, for the first time, you know, a couple of months ago, I was like reading through this, I was just absolutely in tears. Like, I just can't believe this is the amount of support. Now, one of the people um, that I want to talk about is Evelyn Potter. Uh, she was a friend of my grandparents who she had a second home in, um, in, in, uh, in Vietnam. And so she flew over to help, help my parents and uh, look after me. So well, I bruised my frontal cortex, and what, when that, that's in control of your personality. And what happened is I became extremely actively suicidal. I was suicidal all the time. And I had to be watched. And I was also very aggressive, so they, 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 had to hand, they handcuffed me to, to the bed, so I couldn't, I couldn't move. And quite atrocious. And, um, and um, you know, I, 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 didn't have any, I didn't have any filter in my words. And my, it just, I, I, I just wasn't myself. And so when I became too vulgar for my, for my, my family and they left, Evelyn would look, over, look after me and she would distract me by doing, by doing jumping jacks. And, um, and man, I hate it. It just became so annoyed. Like, so I, I, I called her grandma jumping jacks just to, as a way to like, discourage her from, from doing jumping jacks. But it didn't, you know, she, embraced, she embraced that role with love and compassion. And she signs her letters still today with you know, grandma jumping jacks. Really fascinating person. Um, this, this accident, the impact happened on the end of November. Uh, we're now into the week of Christmas, and, uh, or the December 25th. And the December 25th this year was, um, was on a Saturday. And on Thursday, the Thursday before it, uh, my family was being told, uh, because of, because of the, the brain swelling um, and because of the... Um, because of the leaking of the spinal fluid, I couldn't fly. I couldn't, I couldn't leave. I couldn't leave to go back to the hospital in Chicago. Uh, well, to Chicago and then a different hospital. But the, um, um, so that, that was Thursday. But my, 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 my family was being told, hey, make plans to prepare to stay well into the new year. Um, and we, we have, a, we have a, a very risky surgery scheduled on Monday, the Monday after Christmas, um, to to do a craniectomy, which is what they cut the skull open. It's an art and a science. You can't go too deep because it'll damage the brain. You can't cut too short because you won't cut enough. Uh, that was scheduled on Monday. Now, Thursday night and into Friday, somehow um, just a miracle happened. Um, and I, rec I, I recovered well enough to fly, and they, f they rushed over a, 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 a medical doctor from Toronto, Canada. And he was going to look after me and shepherd my family back to Chicago. And it's, a, it's about... I mean, it's, it's, it's a day's trip. It's, you know, including layover, it's probably about 26 hours flight. Um, and uh, so we left. We left on, uh, on the morning of, um, of the 25th, and it was, it was that day when we were in the air. That's when, that's when the giant tsunami, the, the largest earthquake that Asia has ever experienced, causing the Boxing Day tsunami, which has caused the, the, the biggest natural disaster of the 21st century. So we left, left within hours. And I don't know, I mean, they say there's nine lives, right? I'm down three or four right now. Um, so now we get to the recovery. And uh, um, it was becoming more apparent, my new reality, my, the, the new reality of my life. And I couldn't smell, and I can't hear out my left ear probably ever because it's brain damage. It's not, it's not, ear, it's not eardrum damage, it's brain damage. And I had massive uh, peripheral blind spots in my eyes. And my eyes were always constantly swollen. and I would have seizures. The, um, uh, but the, the, biggest, the biggest recovery, I guess, from my perspective, is I can you know, live with those, those things, right? Uh, but um, the, the nurse, the, 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 the medical team kept asking me to walk. And I would refuse. I just, I just wasn't in the mood to walk. I thought I needed to rest my brain. I, you know, like I was mentally exhausted. I was physically exhausted. And, you know, I just had psychological, I just couldn't, I couldn't, um, I couldn't, um, I couldn't, I didn't, I couldn't walk. And I didn't know at the time. But if, if walking is a, is, a, is a very complex motor activity that involves a lot of different parts of your brain, if you actually don't use that due to atrophy, your brain 
loses, forgets how to walk. And I didn't know that. I didn't know that. So anyway, so I, I, I kept saying no, no, you know, to the, to the medical team. And um, finally they had an intervention. They got my friends and my family and they, you know, they, they, they came in. Grandma would come in, mom would come in, dad would come in, brother, sister. I don't say no, I say no. And um, the, um, then my, my roommate Tyler came in and he, you know, he looked me, he just looked me straight in the eye and he, he said, um, he said six words that were the most, the clearest, the clearest words that I, that I can remember from my whole recovery. And he said, he said, get up and walk, damn it. And I, and, and I did, and I did. And it was the hardest thing I've ever had to do. And, um, but I had, I had profound, uh, had profound clarity in that moment um, where I, I, I don't know what happened. Something clicked. I, I realized that I could, I could remain a victim of my circumstances and take the, take the, easy, take the easy route of not walking, just you know, having, having you know, hospital food delivered to me and you know, like stay in a wheelchair. And you know, like I, I, could, I could do that. Or, or I could... I could actively choose to, to be relentless with progress and take the hard route of, of, of making a recovery. And, and that's the route I chose, and it was not easy. But those first couple steps turned into you know, days and, and um, weeks and months of, of, of uh, physiotherapy, speech therapy, occupational therapy. And um, I, I, I recovered quicker than most people imagine, but I, but I, I attribute it per, to, to my mindset, um, lessons in resilience. And I went back to uni, uh, finished my software engineering degree, and I just, I, I had a, I wanted to make up for lost time. And so I, I, took, on, I took on another degree of business and marketing, um, graduated, and I didn't want to take a traditional career route. I just, I just, I didn't feel, I didn't feel like I wanted that. Um, so I took... I took the, uh, the most physically demanding, most dangerous job that I could, and that was a, a wire, a, 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 what's called an oil field wireline engineer. And we're basically in charge of taking special nuclear type equipment and putting into the earth, you know, thousands of, of meters into the earth. There's explosions, and anyway, I almost, I almost, had, I almost caused, a, um, almost caused a, an environmental disaster, and it really woke me up again. And, um, and that is like, I, I, I'm putting myself in danger, I'm putting the environment in danger, I'm putting other people in danger, and I, I left that job. And at that time, there was a hurricane coming through Houston, Texas. I was, I was based on Mexico, Texas border. And um, after some, after some soul-searching, I, uh, I, um, I went to help rebuild the city of Houston, Texas. And while I was there, I got, you know, face-to-face with victims of, of natural disaster and... Um, I was compelled. I was compelled to build an online community where storm victims could be could be um, connected to people that were willing to donate their time or donate their sofa or donate their silverware. Right? I wanted to build that community. So, this is a document on my LinkedIn. I don't need to go into detail, but I, I did a Google search uh, software for an online community, and three ca- three came up. Right? And probably know what they are: Drupal, Joomla, and WordPress. And I st- because of my software engineering background, I studied the code base. I, I, I uh, over a weekend studied the code base of every single one of them, and by far Drupal had the best code base. And I, that's, why, that's why I went with Drupal. Now, over time, I got, you know, as they say, come for the code, stay for the community, right? Like, I got, I got more, intro, I got more um, involved in, in, in Drupal. But, so anyway, so I, I, discovered, I discovered Drupal in Houston. Life had me, it moved me back to Denver, Colorado, and um, I felt compelled to give back. I felt, I felt um, like it was just a, just a, a need um, to prove that the humanity was good and that we need this ominous, <laughs> I love it, <laughs> feel the power of that train. The, uh, um, how are we doing on time? I need to fly through this. Sorry, guys. The, um, anyway, I, was, I, I, I learned Drupal by teaching myself. I wanted to create a, a, a website, a digital experience. Um, I was planning to walk 2,000 miles Forrest Gump style from Denver, Colorado, up to, Toronto, uh, to Ramsden Park in Toronto, Canada. And I was going to build just, just, an, just a digital experience where people could, could see where my journey was and they could donate or if they wanted to walk with me for a certain couple kilometers or miles, they could and they could join me. So that's how I started learning Drupal. And that was in 2000, 2008. And uh, since then, Drupal and I have kind of 
you know, been taken. Uh, we moved to Korea, we moved to, moved to Boston, joined Aquia for a bit, and now it also um, supported me in my on, on moving back to, to New Zealand. Um, all right, so let's, uh, let's talk lessons in resilience. How are we doing on time? Five-ish? Okay, guys, sorry. sorry. The, um, so why do we need to be resilient in the first place? Let's extract that uh, from my, my story. Uh, well, basically, I believe you know, resilience is going to be crucial for us thriving in the future. Um, biology says you know, it's not the strongest that survive. It's not the most... It's, it's not the, um, it's not the smartest that survive, but it's the most adaptable to the environment. That's the species that survives. Now, there's a couple, couple laws that are happening, right? Law of um, accelerated returns, a related Moore's law, which means technology moves, ec the change of technology moves exponentially. And so it takes a long time for it to start, but when it goes, it goes up. And I, you know, I think um, if, if we want to be successful in the future, we have to be resilient because change is, is, gonna, is, is happening around us right now. You know? Um, Drupal's experience it with CK Editor 5, you know, the, the new Symphony stuff. I mean, it, I don't, yeah, change. <laughs> Lessons of resilience. Okay, so I came up with, uh, with four. Um, these are, you know, develop your growth mindset. Um, make sure you have a, a uh, uh, support network and uh, be willing to adapt to change and make sure to take care of yourself. Uh, now, the interesting thing when I was putting this talk together, I actually realized that a lot of these lessons that I was applying to myself in my recovery actually pretty much almost one-on-one -on -one map up with the values of Drupal. Like, I, just, I just couldn't believe this when I found this. And originally, I was on the fence of what I would include the slide, but I did. The, um, and, and I was even more blown away when, when I was just you know, attending some of these talks and these, 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 these values of, of Drupal and these values of resilience kept appearing in talks. So this one we have a, you know, a gloriously labeled talk. I don't know if I've ever seen a longer <laughs> talk label. So congratulations. But, it, but it's exactly what it's, you know, it was great. It was a nice talk, uh, Griffin and Nathan. Um, he, uh, Dries, right, he gave, that, he gave that example of, uh, you know, when Jeremy Andrews and, you know, the slash dot effect and it totally crashed down the Drupal site. You know, Dries could have gave up, he could have, but he had a growth mindset, like, no, let's make this happen. All right, so adapt to change, right? The... Uh, um, yeah, in my story, it's, it's clear that I had to adapt to change. I couldn't hear. I had to really not walk. Um, these questions will help you develop resilience. You know, what's, uh, what's a change you're currently facing and how can you positively adapt to it? And, you know, how can you stay open and uh, flexible when, when unexpected changes occur? Develop a growth mindset. This, you see this quite a bit. Uh, what does it actually mean? Well, it means, uh, in my opinion, it means you believe, you trust in yourself that you can get better and you can improve yourself and you can improve the situation if you dedicate yourself to making it happen. And it's, 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 a, it's, it's choosing your attitude to be optimistic. Uh, so make sure that you, you know, try to be aware of your, your emotions. And, you know, what did you learn from a recent setback or failure? Um, how can you view a, a challenge as an opportunity to grow and, and, and how can you approach a new challenge with curiosity? That's pretty cool. How can, you, how can you approach it with curiosity rather than with fear? And then build a support network, please, please. This is, this is, in, uh, this is kind of important, right? Make sure that you establish your mentors. It's, reach out to friends and family, you know, and, um, and connect with them. I mean, there's a songs written about this. Like, Lean on me. You know, like that, there's, some, there's some wisdom in that song. The, uh, you know, who can you turn to? Make sure you, make sure you know who you can turn to. And how can you, can, how can you contribute? Maintaining this, make sure you maintain your support network because it, like a plant, it'll, it'll, it'll go away if you don't water it. Um, importantly, I think manage, you know, make sure to take care of yourself. So your, that's your mental health. That's your physical health. That's, you know, figure out what it is you like to do. Have your hobbies, right? I know COVID's really changed up a lot of people's habits. And, um, you know, if you used to play the guitar, revisit that and, um, um, you know, make sure you have a healthy balance of work and life. Okay, so that kind of uh, kind of wraps up this, this talk. Um, the takeaways are, you know, from my experience, I've learned that we need to be, uh, you know, have a, a growth mindset. We need to um, maintain a support network, adapt to change, and take care of ourselves and those map to Drupal. Um, you know, we face a lot of changes in our community, so let's, um, let's, let's get up. And let's walk. So thank you guys.